असतो मद्गम तमसो मोतिर्गम मृत्योर्मातंगम ओ लाद प्लीज लीड अस फ्रॉम अनरियालिटी टू द रियालिटी इग्नोरेंस टू द नॉलेज and from mortality to the immortality om peace 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 my dear devotees we are discussing the vedantic preliminary text called aparokshanubhuti what is aparokshanubhuti the meaning of aparokshanubhuti is the immediate realization of the self so in my previous class as i had said the vedanta advaita vedanta the non dualistic philosophy does not believe in the emancipation or the realization after our death or in other words rather it should be experienced it should be felt and it should be we should have in this very life in this mundane world that is the beauty of advaita vedanta and advaita vedanta tells yes you can by trying you can be realized yourself who are you and also you will be free in this very life in this mundane world that is the beauty of non dualistic philosophy a question may come for many of us swami or swami ji this advaita vedanta is very subtle and some sometimes we feel that they are very abstract in concepts also okay since you are a monk or mendicant you don't have any other work other than this you read you study you may have to preach also but being an householder i may be a technocrat i may be a computer savvy i may be a doctor or i may be a celebrity i may be a political entrepreneur whatever so for me how this vedanta will be practicable or will be, how can i apply it in my day to day life how is it applicable to me this question may come for all of us at some point of time yes it should come it is very important from this practical aspect from practical point we should also study advaita vedanta that is the beauty of swami vivekananda who taught to the entire globe started from usa in the west he said he took quite a few lectures on advaita vedanta on the title or in the title practical vedanta so vedanta is not meant for mere thinking mere hypothetical argument it is meant for practice staying in this mundane life i may i may be in any walk of life never mind but i can live i can lead a peaceful life that's what vedanta teaches us now okay everyone want to be peaceful everyone we want bliss we want happy we are all seeking for it now how to lead this life and how vedanta helps to lead this happy life the beautiful example can be given is the life of alexander we all know alexander in the very young age 20 plus itself he started his ambition that is conquering the whole world he started from his homeland and where egypt was a great civilization and it was very well had a army military status etc etc but being from small country and a young chap being an young commander or young prince king the alexander he was able to control or he was able to win over egypt and the whole egypt civilization was probably reduced into ashes the whole military thing so that gave a tremendous confidence in him and also the whole world got terrified by alexander afterwards he conquered so many places and he he came near the part of india which was present pakistan 
Till then he came and afterwards he went. His guru, Aristotle, his teacher Aristotle Ada, when he was coming for this ambitious project, Alexander had asked, my dear venerable teacher, I am going to win over the world and I want to be the great emperor of the whole world or universe. And while coming, I would like to bring something for you. What can I bring? And Aristotle, as we all know, is one of the famous philosopher. As being a philosopher and as being believed in the idea or in the notion or in the philosophy, knowledge per se, knowledge is supreme. He asked, I have heard that in India, there are a lot of philosophers, it seems. Can you bring a philosopher so that where I can discuss with him the philosophy? That's why we can remember here, Swam Vekanda said that every Indian is a born philosopher. Anyhow, so when he came and after, when he had a fight with Porus, we Pururava, we say, after having a win there, then he asked, O King Porus, my guru has asked a philosopher, can you get me? Then the King Porus said, oh, we have got n number of philosophers. In every street, we get philosophers. We don't have any problem for that. We are in abundance. There are a lot of philosophers. I can get it. Then the King Porus or Pururava ordered his chief commander, you go and try to get the best philosopher. So for us, the philosopher means in generally, their monks or the sadhus or the saints. And generally, they all live in the outside of the town, generally, or they live in the forest, hermits. So they went to the forest. They, one, uh, they, one famous monk was there, was known for his Brahmagdana, the knowledge of Brahman. And there was a faith among the society that he has relished Brahman. So the chief in commander of the porous felt that this can, he can be the best person. So the chief in command of the Porus, the chief in commander of the Alexander, and a small army containing 10 to 15 people, they all went for that sadhu. And he said, look, my great king, Alexander the Great, he has asked you to come. He will take to his home country. Why don't you come? Then the sadhu said, I have no one. I am believing in God and I'm leading my life. For me, no, no one is emperor for me. No one is king. For me, the king is God. I'm not listening to anyone's talk. If I wish, I will come. Otherwise, I won't. They threatened, they prayed, they pleaded, all these things, but he said no. Then the whole army and the both chief and commanders, they went and told. And for Alexander, that was a rude shock. Why? Big, big kings, chief and commanders, the big armies were frightened. And they had a fear when they saw Alexander and the Alexander army. Here a person who is having just a lion claw on his body. He doesn't have any weapon. He doesn't have any army. Even he doesn't have one more person to support him. Such a person said, I will not come to, or I will not burst to the call of Alexander. Get out. For Alexander, it was a rude shot. Alexander said, come for, he questioned chief in command. Did you say that? that I am Alexander the Great, the emperor of the world is asking, are his calling, are I awarded? The chief and commander said, yes, my dear, yes, Lord. Then also he didn't come, no, my Lord. Then Alexander thought, okay, come, I will go and I will bring him. He was very confident that he will be able to bring the sadhu so that he will be able to take for his country and his guru, teachers, Aristotle's desire will be fulfilled, wish will be fulfilled. Then with a the small army, again, he comes back to the forest. And this sadhu, he was just with a lion cloth and without having any dress on his body. He was just near the river. He was just sleeping or he was lying on a rock. Then Alexander came with all paraphernalia, then said, I heard that you are not coming to my country. Why? Then the sadhu said, why should I come? He said, because I am the emperor of the Gray of the world, that's why you should come because I'm ordering. Then the sadhu laughs and he says, Oh, you are the greatest liar. Why? How can I be the greatest liar? Why? Because you are not the greatest uh, emperor of the world. The Lord is the greatest emperor of the world. You might have won few battles, 
you might have a piece of land in your name it may be very huge but you are not the emperor of the world okay that's okay please come to my country i will give riches then this sadhu asked you want to give riches what you can give me he said thousands of gold coins then then what if if you want anything else i can give you then the sadhu said okay my dear how are you going back to your country he said i am going back to uh, my country through gujarat and rajasthan how oh, that means you will be crossing a big desert a big part of desert isn't it yes then when crossing a desert you may be thirsty you don't have a water or you may not have any food what will you do the alexander said oh don't worry uh, monk probably that is a i mean a creating problem for you don't worry we have got enough uh, card, cards of food and we have got enough water in stock never mind you need not to fast we will take care of you then the sadhu said it is not my that is not my concern okay since you are going in the desert now while going for argument sake let us feel that the water is been over whatever you had a stock the whole water is been over and you are very thirsty what will you do then the alexander said i will try to search water body or for water then the sadhu said fine a person who has got have a, a small you can see in the desert in the olden days in the leather bag they used to carry water where you used to feel thirsty they used to have a sip of water from that so he says that a person is carrying a a liter of water in his leather bag and is coming opposite side what will you do he says that i will ask then the sadhu said fine but he says i will not give what will you do this alexander said no probably i will ask him to give 100 by giving 100 10 or 100 golden coins then he may not give 1000 gold coins he may not give then i have got lot of pearls and lot of diamonds gold things i may like give him then the sadhu was even still he doesn't want to give you are so thirsty you need a sip of water what will you do then the alexander said whatever wealth i have got everything i will give and i will see that i will try to see that i will try to get that water a liter of water then the sadhu he laughed loudly and he said see whatever the wealth you have got it was boiled down to it is equal to just a liter of water and here bhagirathi are the big river is flowing here and i have got enough food by having lot of uh, delicious fruits and healthy roots are there which is given by nature which is given by god and i am getting a good fresh water here so why to need and this whole forest this whole earth is my homeland wherever i want i can sleep wherever i want i can reside and i need food i need water and the lord has given in this forest abundantly why should i come i will not come go so this was the greatest lesson for alexander in all of his life so this is the greatness of spirituality so this is the greatness of philosophy this is the greatest greatness of advaita vedanta the same idea is beautifully explained by swami vivekananda in kandana bhava bandana aratrikam sang there sampada tava shri pada bhava gosh pada varyata means your feet is the greatest wealth for us it it is such a greatest wealth whoever has got your lotus feet whoever has got a divine grace for such a person the whole world will be just like gosh pada means go means cow when cow walks on the bare land and if there is a water it has got a good rain and the it has been wet and if it makes a step and it leaves a mark a small amount a small hole will be there and if any rain comes and very few droplets will be there in that you can remember that isn't it so a person who has got the divine grace wealth for such a person the whole world will become just like goshpada means the space which is occupied by the go or by the cow how small it will be and few droplets will be there like that the soul samsara the world will be a small place and he or she will be able to cross over the samsara he or she will be able to cross over this world that's beautiful idea given by swam vekananda in the uh, khandana vabandana so here we understand when we study advaita vedanta when this uh, viveka is awakened in us 
then we may be in any walk of our life, we will be able to handle the things in a proper way. We don't get prejudiced. We don't get wrong notions and we'll be able to carry our life. The greatest example one can be taken as King Janaka. He was the king and he was able to think most of the time about philosophy. And his whole, I mean, kingdom was with surplus, with abundance, with prosperity. He was able to do his work. At the same time, he was able to do Atma Chintana or thinking of higher ideas. Why? Because he was a relished person. And these ideas are beautifully explained in Universal Message of Bhagavad Gita, penned by Swami Ranganathanji. Like an officer can be the best officer. A doctor can be the best doctor. A solicitor can be the best solicitor. An engineer can become the best engineer. A business entrepreneur can be can become the best business entrepreneur by studying Advaita Vedanta. That's what. So I asked a question for you. Why we should study Advaita Vedanta? So because to become a better person internally and as well as externally. So that is the necessity of Advaita Vedanta. And philosophically, the fear of death is the greatest phobia we every being has got. And that can be conquered by studying Advaita Vedanta. Why? What Advaita Vedanta teaches? Advaita Vedanta teaches, after all, what is my real nature? I know my real nature. I have got biodata. I have no who am I, my degree, my parents' name, my would-be name, my children, and my caste, my country, religion, all these things, fine. That is all belong to this body. The address, all these things belong to the body. The I am not the body. Oh, I am happy. I am so-and-so. I have achieved many things. I can think that. I can do this. Yes, all these things belong to your mind, belong to your willpower, belong to your thoughts, belong to your emotions. Again, you are not that. You are different from this. You are that Atman or consciousness. So this is what Atma and Anatma Viveka. Discrimination between self and non-self. And that's what has been explained in the 16th sloka in Aparokshanabhuti. Just we had started the, we had started to understand this. Now we will go in bit in detail in this 16th sloka. Aham ekaha api sukshmascha gnata sakshi sadavyaya tadaham na Atra Sandehaha Vicharaha Soyami Drusha. As I means here the consciousness or the self or the Atman. As I am also the one, I am the one, I am the subtle, I am the knower, I am the witness, I am the ever existent, and I am unchanging. So there is no doubt that I am that, I am that Atman or Brahman. Such is this enquiry. So what is this enquiry? How to do this self-enquiry has been told in this loka. Or uh, who am I in reality that biodata is given in this loka? I am the one. I am not many. I am only one. So what do we mean by I am one? The Atman or consciousness is only one. Then there are hundreds of beings. Then I, you, everyone should become one. Then how is that we are having a thousands of people, hundreds of people? Oh, they are all reflecting medium. Probably I gave an example in the previous class, if you remember. For an example, there are thousands of mirrors are kept outside. And you can see the reflections will be thousand mirrors. If you have kept thousand suns will be there. Then can we say that thousand suns are there? No. In our solar system, we have got only one sun as of now. So there's only one sun that has been well accepted. Then thousand suns, they're only reflections. So similarly, each being has got the subtle body and the subtle body is called just like reflecting medium. So we think that there are millions of Atmans, millions of selves, thousands of selves. There are only thousands of or millions of reflecting mediums called subtle body, but Atman or Brahman is only one. That is what we have to understand. And this is a very beautiful and very subtle idea. We have to think all of us. We all think that I am the body and I am having an Atman. I am the body and having Atman. No, that is a wrong notion. That is a stupid thinking. Then what is right thinking? I am Atman, but having the body. I am the body 
having the atman generally we think no it is a wrong thinking we are supposed to think i am the atman and having the body this is very very important and when i say that i am one what do we infer from this that means what consciousness as i know is not a part of anything it is not a product of anything it is not a property of anything that's what we understand we can deduce these values this understanding from the word one when we say consciousness is only one or it is one means it is not two that means what it is not part of something it is not product of something for example dublin dublin is a part of the ireland isn't it now i was eating a full, wonderful jam oh jam is made by if it is a fruit jam the fruit jam fruit jam is the product of the fruits from fruits the jams the jam is the fruit jam is been prepared it the product jam is prepared from produced by the fruits so similarly for example ice cream yes ice cream is created by the milk cream or whatever for example sweets sweets are prepared from sweet the product sweet is prepared from the milk actually like that the atman is prepared from something the atman is the product of something just like this body is product of five gross elements then the atman is also product of something no atman is independent in existence it is not the product of something and it is not the property of any matter or any substance all this understanding can be deduced by one word atman is one then sukshmascha and it is subtler why we are able to see like the physical body we are able to see many things but atman cannot be seen then you may say swami ji that means amoeba we we are not able to see bacteria we are not able to see through our naked eyes virus we are not able to see covid covid now we are all facing all this corona virus corona virus we are not able to see through our naked eyes then atman and corona virus can be similar then atman and amoeba can be similar one no it is subtler than all these things means here atma is subtler that means what we will not be able to comprehend from body and mind that's what we are supposed to understand when we say atman is sukshmascha it is also subtler subtler than the subtlest so subtler or what is the subtler we can say atom as a now for us atom or proton neutron electron nucleus we can say even it is subtler than the subtlest even it is subtler the atman is subtler than the atom then that means it is so tiny even than the atman that do we mean swami ji no we don't mean that that means what it is not at all any object it is subject that's what we mean to say that it is subtler than the subtlest now gnata the third value or the third nature given by the author is atman is gnata in uh, next uh, in second or third shloka this uh, subject will be coming i will take there so i will that's why i will switch over to now the next thing atman is sakshi witness the sakshi witness is a very beautiful thing most of us we are not aware of it we should start practicing it and this is told beautifully in the kshetra kshetragna yoga that is 13th chapter in bhagavad gita and it is beautifully spoken in discussed in mandukya karika in one of the upanishads i am the witness how to give an example i will give an example then probably you will be able to understand you had been to river three people one person was said i will not get into the water and he was just standing on the banks or on the bridge he was standing and just he was watching and other two people they went they went into water and they were nicely they were enjoying they were splashing the water on each other they swam and they played and they are enjoying like each other beautifully they are enjoying in the water and this fellow is just is observing unfortunately someone had connected the gutter or the drainage into the river this is unfortunately seen in many many undeveloped countries and even this is seen in india many times the drainages are linked with the rivers unfortunately it is which is a, a serious uh, environmental hazard it creates so some drainage was connected with the river at some point of time they left the drainage water and drainage water got mixed up and it started flowing in the river in the flow in the 
Now these fellows, they saw, oh, the drainage water has been mixed up with the river water and it is coming. And now they want to get away from this. They don't want to get contaminated from this. They may get disease and it will have a foul smell, all these things. However, they were trying to come away or to get on the bank, but still since they were in the middle of the river, it took some time for them to come out. By that time, the drainage water had touched them. The drainage water flow has come and it has crashed over on them and they started feeling it is stinky smell. It has got very foul, bad smell. Oh my God, why did I get into the water? Now you see, earlier, the same two guys, they were enjoying with the water. And the other person who was on the bridge, just was witnessing. And now, these two guys, because the gutter water, the drainage water touched them and they're having a stinky smell, foul smell on their body, they're not happy and they're morose. Sometime back they were happy and now they are morose. But the fellow who was on the bridge earlier when these people were happy, he was just witnessing. Now they are morose. At the same time, even now also he is neither happy nor unhappy. He is a witness. And the same thing is in our mind also, in us also. Lower mind, higher mind. This is beautifully explained in the Mundak Upanishad. They give an example of two birds in a tree. Two birds are sitting. One bird was sitting simply, quietly. The other bird was trying to enjoy the fruits, whatever in the tree. Sometimes when the fruits, the bird ate the fruits, sometimes few fruits were very sweet, it delicious, it enjoyed, it was so happy. And it was seeing the uh, bird which was sitting on the upper branch, but it was keeping quiet, a composed nature. And this fellow thought, okay, the bird sitting in the higher branch, it is, it, is, it is actually missing a lot. Why? It is not eating anything. So such a delicious fruit. And after some time, again, the, this bird which was sitting in the lower branch, it jumped to the other branch and it, it tried to eat some other fruits and they were sour. And immediately went, oh, wow. Earlier, this same bird, it enjoyed with the delicious fruit, sweet fruits, and now the same bird, it is unhappy because of the, because it had to eat sour fruits. Whereas the upper bird, it never was happy nor unhappy. Then this bird started thinking, Are, earlier when I was happy, it was of composed nature. There was no reaction in that bird. And now I am unhappy. And even though, even though, the bird is neither happy or unhappy, just it is peaceful, it is blissful, it is composed. How beautiful it is, isn't it? Because sometimes I'm, I'm happy, sometimes I'm unhappy. Sometimes I'm agitated, sometimes I am with full of zest. Like that he started thinking, that bird started thinking, slowly, slowly, it started jumping into different branches and it started going up and it went near that bird and it saw that bird and the himself or itself, both are one and the same. The birds, the upper birds, reflection is only the small bird or the bird which was sitting on the lower branch. That means what? Actually, the Jiva Atman or Brahman is the bird which was sitting on the upper branch. And the Jiva Atman or the so called embodied soul or the body and mind mixed with the consciousness is the lower bird which was happy sometimes, which was unhappy sometimes. The moment the bird went, went into the upper branch and it saw the bird which was sitting in the upper branch and it, it came to know that both are one and the same. I and that bird were one and the same. It was only its reflection. So similarly, when I understand that I am neither body nor mind, I am consciousness. What happens? This blissful state will happen. Situations may not change. World may not change. People may not change, but reactions will change. Whose reactions? My reactions will change. That's why Lord Buddha has given a beautiful answer. What is the secret? If by living in the world, how can I be happy at all times? Lord Buddha says that. How? Think that this will also go away or this will also pass away. When you, if you keep this formula in your mind, what happens? You can be happy at all times. In favorable circumstances, situations, we are happy. We need not to teach. No one need to teach for us. But at unfavorable circumstances, when we face failure, when we have problems, when we have got uh, stress at that time, during that time, can we have a composed nature? Are we, can we have a happy mindset? Yes. 
when I start practicing witness. So Atman is really Sakshi. Why? It is neither the doer nor the enjoyer. It is consciousness. So this enjoying, suffering, all these things belongs to, belongs to mind. So I'm mistaking myself with the mind. Myself, I am attached myself with the mind and I am saying that. I am superimposing that. So if like my mind is happy, I am feeling that I am happy. My mind is unhappy, I am feeling that I am unhappy. I am neither happy nor unhappy. I am blissful and I am above this happiness and unhappiness. All the dualities. And that is the state of witness. And that is my real nature. But now we are confused. We have jumbled up things. That's why we are struggling and, and we are suffering. So I am the witness beyond all the dualities, above all the dualities. So that's what we can understand by this one word, I am the witness. Then, sad avyayaha. Sad means existent. Existence, probably in my earlier classes I have told. Now, gold is there, milk is there, iPad is there, computer is there, pen is there, pencil is there. There are so many things. There is there, is there, is there. We are telling so many different things. But in all these things, one is common, is there. Ah, yes, double quote. Means what? That is existence. The existence-ness is there in everything. That is the universal principle. Apart from that, they have got their individual qualities also. In the pen, there is a penness. In the cow, there is a cowness. In the tiger, there is a tigerness. In the human being, if there is a humanness, then only they are called human being. Just you have got a human body, you cannot call human, human beings, though we say that. That is all uh, special characters, isn't it? The universal character is ease. So that ease or existence for everything, for sentient or non-sentient, insentient, for everything, this Sat is the existence. And that is what the Brahman or Atman, and that is my natural uh, quality. That is what existence or Sat. Avyaya. Avyaya means unchanging. I am the unchanging. How can you say, Swami? 20 or 30, 40 years before, I was a kid. Afterwards, I became little grown up, then adolescent, youth, then slowly, slowly, I will go to middle age, then I'll become age and I'll pass away. How can you say, Swami, I'm unchanging? I'm not at all changeable? No. In this world, everything is changing. Heraclitus says, everything is in flux. Everything is changing. A school of philosophy also says, Buddhist philosophy, that everything is changing. There's nothing eternal. How can you say that I'm unchanging? When I say that, yes, from birth to death, you've got a lot of changes in, at physical level, no doubt, and even at a mental level, no doubt, that is happening with your body and mind, not in yourself. Even for your child, the conscious or the sense of I and when you were middle-aged or uh, youth, the sense of I in the middle-aged, the sense of I in the old age, the sense of I remains constant. I, the experiencer, the sense of experiencer, the sense of I remains constant. Only there is a change in body and mind. So I am that unchanging. That's what we have to understand. But many times we have confused so much. There is so much attachment and there's so much mixed up, jumbled up. We are not able to differentiate ourselves. I and this body. I and this mind. I means my real nature, Atman. Atman means I here. I and the emotions. I and thoughts. I and the things. I and the world are things we are somewhat will be able to understand. But I am not the body. I am not the mind. It is difficult to understand. Difficult to comprehend again and again. That's why author is trying to tell you are not all of these things. He's, he wants to make us understand and make us to have a conviction and experience. That's the reason author is trying to tell in a different ways. So the we have seen. Tadaham, that's the reason. Na atra sandhya. And there is no doubt at all. There is no iota of doubt. Sandeha vicharaha soyam midrusha. And we are supposed to do self inquiry in this manner, in this way. Who am I? Like I am the subtle, subtler than the subtlest. I am the witness. I am the existence. And I am the unchanging. And I am not this body and mind. So this type of inquiry is called self inquiry. That's how we have to do self inquiry and have to reach 
there is what neti neti or soham soham i am that i am that or i am not this i am not this i am not this these are the two paths given by advaita vedanta the nandistil philosophy so these are the things mm, they are the part of this advaitic sadhana by which i will be able to understand i will try to understand who am i for an example now of course we have got all google we'll put google for an example now in from dublin city center someone want to come to ayurvedanta society we put ayurvedanta society and in the google it shows we follow the route map probably 10 years before yes is you ask where is ayurveda muladat where is muladat how to go muladat you keep on asking you keep on asking the people say you take right you take left you go straight to take roundabout in roundabout you take second second and you are taking somewhere you missed a road and when you start asking people oh no this is not the road which leads to mullarat you have to take a different road go in different go in this path so when you were going in the path yes this is the road which takes to mullarat soham i am that yes i am that atman i am that brahman i am that unchanging i am the witness i am the existence this is what you have taken a wrong route which was not taking to mullarat but still you had a, you thought that that will take a mullarat and you had been for some more distance then the people start telling no this will not take this path will not take into the mullarat you have to go in a different way and you keep on now changing your route and either right or left or back whatever you are taking that is what neti marga i mean in a crude way i am explaining you trying to so in this what is so soham means what i am has been explained in the 16th sutra i mean sorry 16th shloka now 17th onwards four or five shlokas the author beautifully explains what is ignorance since we have got ignorance about our true nature real nature we are suffering so in the 17th shloka onwards three or four shlokas the author tries to explain what is the ignorance and what is the nature of ignorance and why we have confused ourselves with the body and mind atma vinishkalo heko deho bahuviravrutah tayoraikam prapashyanti kim agnanam ataparam atma the atman or the soul vinishkalah vinishkalah means without parts nishkala vinishkala without parts means for an example body has got so many parts i have got head i have got hands i have got legs trunk and all similarly a car has got so many parts so like that atman has got any parts no it doesn't have any parts it is without parts he verily surely yeka it is only one we have already seen same thing same idea has been told here it is one single so this is the nature of atman okay then what is the nature of body then is the body is also one are you going to say then are you going to say that body also without parts no deha the body the physical body bahubihi by many avrutah covered means the body consists of many parts head trunk back back or stomach or hands legs and among legs you have got toes and among in the hands you have got fingers elbow so many things yes it is covered with the body parts tayoh of these two among them aikyam identity prapashyanti you are seeing kim agnanam what ignorance atah param than this ajay the atman our soul is really one and it doesn't have any parts whereas the, there are innumerable bodies and the body consists parts and how they are diagonally the di- uh, diagonally opposite but you people are mistaking one with each other and what else can be the greater ignorance than this see how beautifully he is telling and he is slapping us actually the author is slapping us you fools you are not able to understand why you are not the body you are not the mind upanishad is telling again and again the advaita vedanta is telling you again and again and but you are confusing yourself how because atman is only one and it doesn't have any parts and whereas the body has got many parts and there are many bodies too so more or less here the i mean the meaning is very simple so we we need to Uh, discuss much only i would like to tell the beauty of ignorance is what ignorance has got two powers actually what are that it is called technically avarna shakti and vikshepa shakti 
Avarna means, Avarna Shakti means the power of covering. The ignorance covers an object first. Since for an example, an object has been brought in front of you, which is covered with a wrapper. And if you are, if I, if I ask you, what is this? You say, Swami, I don't know because you're covered with the wrapper. How can I know? I say, just imagine, just try to tell. So you imagine, and most of the times it may be wrong. And by a, because of imagination, because the wrap is covered on the object which I'm showing you. So you are not able to comprehend what is that object and you are miscomprehend because maybe seeing the shape or being seeing the thing. So assuming you are assuming some other object, but when you open the wrapper, you'll be able to understand whatever you were saying, all of them are wrong. You had a misconception. So that is the covering, the ignorance covers an object, covers the knowledge, true knowledge, covers the object that is called power of covering, Avarna Shakti. Because it has been covered and it has been projected as something else, that is called Vikshepa Shakti. I am seeing the object as something else. For example, the beautiful standard example in Advaita Vedanta is seeing the robe as snake. First of all, because of ignorance, because of uh, improper light, I did not see the rope as a rope and I saw or I, I saw the rope as a snake. So this is what Avarna Shakti and Vikshepa Shakti, power of covering and power of projecting as something else. This is what ignorance is. And because of this ignorance, we are thinking that the body and mind are real and I am the body or I am the mind. Neither I am the body, nor I am the mind. And also in Advaita Vedanta, they say the Maya, the other name of ignorance, is so beautiful, it is so glorious that it is making impossible possible. What it is making impossible possible? That we told that Atman is only one, it has not any parts, it is no, it is consciousness. Whereas the body and mind, it has, the body has got parts, it is unconscious, it is insentient actually, and it has got many parts, but still we feel, which are diagonally opposite, but we feel both are one and the same. We have got affinity, we have got attachment, and we have got wrong notions. That is the beauty of Maya, which makes impossible possible. Like darkness and light, dark and light, can it coexist? At the same place, at the same time, we say no. But still in Maya, because of Maya, it is happening. The darkness and ignorance, the darkness and light is I mean, existing or staying together as if like, though I am consciousness, I am the light, I am the knowledge, but I am thinking the unconscious thing as myself. So Atman doesn't have any parts. It is Niravayava and the body is Savayava, means it has got parts. Then Swami, when we say that I am fat, I am thin, I am beautiful, I am ugly looking. When I say I, I, this I refers to physical body. When I say I am humble, I'm happy, I am unhappy, I'm enthusi I am enthusiastic. When you say this all refers to your emotions, which is a part of body. Oh, he or she is an intelligent, he's such a beautiful, intelligent lady. He or she is a dull-headed fellow. He or she is a unintelligent uh, or intelligent when we say all these things belong to their thought process, belong to their intellect, not to themselves actually. I am happy and happy refers to emotions and I am perturbed, I am hurted. That refers to your pseudo ego. And if you say that someone is intelligent, someone is thoughtful, they, their thoughts are very good. Yes, it all refers to their thoughts. It is not to him or it is not, it doesn't refer to the consciousness or Atman. So we have to understand. The same, now the nature of ignorance has been continued in the next sloka also. Atma niyama kascha niyama kascha antar deho bahyo niyama kaha niyamya kaha tayo raikam prapashyanti kim agnanam atahparam What else I am confused to see, I am astonished to see what better ignorance can be there, how foolish uh, thinking people are having. That's what the second line says that continues for some more shlokas. He is telling why Atma, the Atman or the soul. Of course, in Western 
philosophy sometimes is also told as spirit but spirit is something to do with the mind that's what so that's why atma means it is soul it is better to have the notion of or uh, thinking that it is a soul niyamaka the atman is the controller cha antaha antaha means it is not end it is internal the atman is the controller and atman is the internal means indweller internal means indweller he surely verily bahya sorry deha the body the grass body physical body is bahya it is external means external it is seen external it is niyamya kaha it is controlled meaning just simple sentence if you want me to tell the atman is the atman is internal is atman is indweller and is the ruler of the body and whereas the body is external and it has been ruled now how to understand this for an example i am moving a house i different and house is different house is not owing me i am owing the house i am the owner of the house i am possessing the house actually i mean again body is possessing i mean it is not actually atman so similarly the consciousness is possessing the body body doesn't possess consciousness so when i am possessing home that means what i am the controller i am the owner of the house isn't it for example i am possessing a thing thing should not control me but i should control things but it doesn't happen with the mobile with the tv i purchased by giving maybe 100 500 euros and i purchased mobile fine i am the owner of that mobile fine but in no time i am so much addicted mobile has become the owner of me why because mobile tells me what to do and what not to do i am so much addicted to the mobile so that mobile is telling me mobile is trying to lead me that's what happens sometimes in the world but it is not supposed to be so here they are saying that atman is the controller and this body is the controlled just like the lord is the controller and the whole world is controlled by the lord so similarly i am the controller and the body is controlled and i am the internal indweller then you can say when atman is there everywhere you said in one of your class atman is omniscient you said atman is there everywhere there is no place where there is no soul there is no consciousness then you were saying atman is indweller how is it that means the atman is limited when atman is limited then how can you say that atman is one when we say is indweller it is only trying to we are only trying to under, make you understand that it is the source of your energy that's all it doesn't mean that it only lives in your body and it is not outside we don't mean and also when you say atman is controller that means he is a karta he is a doer because you are saying atman is a controller and the body has been controlled and you said in the previous shloka explaining if you follow my uh, argument or thought process properly or you said atman is neither the doer nor the enjoyer and yourself you are contradicting your own statement now you are saying atman is niyamakah that is the controller how is it how do can you contradict swami because you think that we are all fools no here the atman is controller in what sense we are told means atman does not direct physically any action it only because of consciousness as a supply of energy as a supply of energy as a supply of conscious as a witness in the witness of atman so everything exists or everything goes on how just like sun there's a sun sun doesn't do anything sun only is, is giving light with the help of light plants are preparing their food that's called photosynthesis and we are able to walk and children are able to play we are able to see without the light now do you say that sun is preparing the food for the plants then do you can we say that sun is the responsible for our travel for our movements no with the help of sunlight we are all using the sunlight and we are doing our own respective actions so similarly the atman is there as a witness using that power are you getting the power from the atman we do the body and mind does the work so when you say atman is the controller that means what with the existence of atman the activities can go on otherwise it is not so 
just like our, our the, in the better the better way of example uh, one more also can be given is like there's a money lender or like i am either i have got a good friend and is a very good person is a very charitable minded person he is lending a money for me since i have got money issues he is lending money since he is lending money i am able to purchase food i am able to purchase whatever the necessary things from in my day to day life because he is giving money i am able to purchase the moment he stops giving money then i will not be able to purchase anything so indirectly he will be regulating my expenses my day to day things so in that way atman indirectly he tries to control how by mere existence because atman is there inside and outside everywhere and also other way of i think that atman is existence and consciousness whereas the body and mind is drawing the energy from this atman and it is doing their work just like the moon oh the, uh, two days before we had a, a full moon day beautiful moonlight we had we had a moonlight dinner fine the moonlight or the light which is coming from the moon is it its original is it uh, the light belongs to moon the light is coming from the moon that's why we call it as a moonlight but actually we know that moon doesn't have its own original source of light it always draws the light from the sun and it emits isn't it the light which is coming from the moon it is not its original it has been borrowed from the sun so similarly the body and mind draws the energy from the consciousness and and it leaves and it leaves and it tries to do its work so in this way we are saying that the atman is the controller and the body and the mind is the controlled and how to understand that is the indweller probably one example is given in upanishads i am in a deep sleep your your physical body is at rest and your subtle body your sense organs and your mind is also at rest that's why your mind doesn't work in deep sleep your body doesn't work there are reflex mechanical actions fine but your body consciously doesn't work but still as i get up i say oh beautiful wonderful blissful why because i had a good sleep then if you are not there how can you have a experience of the good sleep yes because the atman was there that's why you were you were able to experience now i cannot experience your nature of the sleep i cannot say oh you had a good sleep we cannot say why because it is belong to your own experience isn't it so even from this point we can understand that atman is indweller and also one more technically it has been discussed or we can understand when we say atman is indweller atman is internal atman is inside means it is unremovable or unstoppable like for example water can be removed from the water body a thing is dropped it breaks it ceases to exist but it cannot be with consciousness consciousness exists everywhere internal and external everywhere so just here uh, inside means it is unremovable undroppable this also one more uh, shade of the meaning of the inside i think one more shloka i thought but it is almost time now i think enough for today ओम शांति 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 हरि ओम तत्सत श्रीरामकृष्णापणमस्तु